and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle, from tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride. Let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are at pedalshift.net slash 179, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net, or call the voicemail hotline at 202-930-1109, and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 179th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name is Tim Mooney, and I am excited to have you on board for the uh, first, as I'm sitting here, uh, I think this is the first one. Yes, this is the first episode of fall uh, officially here on the Pedal Shift Project, uh, fall 2019, of course. And uh, if you hear it in my voice, I'm a little bit lower energy tonight uh, because I've been doing a bit of travel over the last few days. Um, Not super bike related, although I did get some biking in. I was in the great city of Montreal and got to hang out with the guy who did the song you heard at the top of the show and every top of the show, Jason Kent. We had a really fun time, but I'm, I'm here to tell you. Uh, we we burnt the midnight oil. We stayed out a little late on the first night. It was it was like a three thirty arrival time when all think well it was uh, said and done. And I'm just here to tell you that is not part of my normal daily uh, entertainment kind of bedtime kind of thing. So I am <laughs> I'm still kind of uh, recovering from that. But I was uh, really excited because I was able to do some uh, work up in Montreal. And did a, uh, a thing for uh, J- uh, Jason's girlfriend's uh, yoga studio. And uh, that was a lot of fun. But the best part was I biked from their home uh, to the studio and back. And it was just a lot of fun. That was, I think, the first time that I ever did any real biking in the city of Montreal. And I'm here to tell you, it was really, really nice. I uh, borrowed Jason's uh, Bixie uh, bike share key because uh, he wasn't needing it. And it was great. Um, those things are tanks, just like the ones that we have here in D with Capital Bike Share, a very similar design, and it was great. Now, it was much more fun, I'm here to tell you, going down the hill to the studio, but I ended up ha- running into it a bit of an issue because I ran into the Montreal Marathon, and as many of you know, I barely speak uh, English lang- the English language, my mother tongue, English, uh, so my French was a little bit rusty <laughs> figuring out um, the directions folks were giving me uh, to get uh, around the area, but um, they switched to English thankfully for me and then we I was able to get to the studio on time it was it was a lot of fun and then the return trip I took a, it took my sweet time coming back I was going up the big hill I, I toyed with a moment of getting one of the uh, e-bikes that they have but then decided you know what I'm just gonna suck it up and and go up the hill I've got I've got plenty of uh, of leg power from all the touring that I've done this year and it was no big deal at all and it was a lot of fun really cool uh warm for this time of year up there so I missed the hot down here so Totally great on all of that. But anyways, that was sort of my most recent bikey style adventure uh, in the last few days. And before that, I did some other stuff, and that's going to end up on the podcast. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that now. We've got some great shows coming down the pike. Next week, we've got a great best of. Um, you'll I, I don't recall which one it is off the top of my head, but it's going to be great, and you'll love it, I hope. Um, anyways, that's next week. Uh, we've got an unexpected this was this is where the other recent biking came in uh, we have an unexpected coda to the c and o tour journal and that's going to be coming the week after and then some old friends pop by pedal shift world headquarters here and we've got much much more coming down the pike later this fall really cool stuff in the works i'm excited to share it with you on this episode, however, you have waited four minutes and you still have not gotten to this episode. We are chatting with Adele and Brock Didis, whom you have heard on this show before. This is the adventurous outdoorsy couple that have let us all learn about their past bike tours and in both their, their written word and their appearances on a variety of podcasts, including this one. Of course, you may also know Brock from back episodes of the Sprocket podcast, where he's the current producer and host emeritus. Uh, But here's the thing. Adele and Brock had a son recently, and that kind of changed a lot of things. But they didn't let it stop them from slapping a helmet on on the kid (laughs) and taking him out on a super bikey adventure. I think that the trip that they're about to share with you will get you parental types out there stoked to get your kids to join you on the next bike tour. Tons of great advice from Adele and Brock on this one. And even if you don't have kids like me, hey, I just learned a whole heck of a lot and really enjoyed listening about their adventure. So without further ado, here's Adele and Brock. (laughs) 
as introduced everybody uh, prior here, we've got Brock Adele and Cyrus Didis here on Pedal Shift Hotline chat room thing here that we got going on. Hi there. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Cyrus says doggy. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, doggy because he's just sitting here in his high chair commenting. And he's seen that the dogs are on the video feed on my end. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's good recognition. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, as w- most folks who have listened to the show have been introduced to you two already. If you are new to the show, I believe uh, both of you have been on at least four times and Brock probably about a dozen times. Um, and oh you God. you uh, lead a very adventurous life. And then all of a sudden you decided you went out and you had a kid. And I'm, I thought that it would be awesome to talk about the bike tour that you recently went on. But before we get to that, uh, I'm curious. Uh, about some of the things that you did going before going out on bike tour, you know, you you did things with Cyrus. There was no way you weren't going out on adventures. How did how did you kind of set yourselves up for success on this? Yeah, well, that's a great question to lead with. Um, I guess like basically, I started looking at bike family touring blogs when Cyrus was a year old because I was you know at home with this tiny infant and going a little stir crazy already and kind of dreaming about future adventures. And I was wondering what, you know, an appropriate age would be to start bike touring with a kid. Um, And to back up a little bit, like, I, you know, envisioned we'd have a kid sometime down the road. And we had bike toured with a family back in like 2000, 2011, 2011 to Crater Lake. So I knew a bike touring with children was possible. Um, And so I'd always imagined, you know, like sort of, a very just dim picture like oh when we have a kid we'll go bike touring right and then finally it was like okay we have the kid what do we need so that we can make this a reality um so a big piece of planning for the bike tour which happened almost a year after he was born was um we got a great bike trailer and we put that on uh I made sure to put that on the baby registry we just had like a big you know crowd like friends put in money towards this um, fancy new bike trailer. I actually got it secondhand, so I got a pretty good, pretty good deal on it. And then when Cyrus was about like two months old, I started putting him in it just so he could get, get used to it. And it was also our jogger. So it's the um, Thule Chinook Chariot. Um, it's a Thule Chariot, the model of Chinook. It's like a one seater. And it also converts into a jogging stroller and a little like um, cross country skiing chassis. Really? Um, which I don't have that conversion kit yet. I really like really want to get one so I can pull him. I was while just going to say you have to do that. We, yeah. we, we will have it at some point. I really, I really want this. And you pop off the wheels and you um, put on little skis and then there's like a hitch that goes around the, the adult's waist and you like pull your child through the snow. Um, so it's a pretty great way to like keep doing all the activities you love to do before you had a kid. That's like the idea behind this. And um so we had that set up. So Cyrus was pretty used to being in this stroller slash bike trailer since the time he was really little. Um, so yeah. So and then when he was about, uh, I don't know, four or five months old, I started taking him on like little rides around the neighborhood. Nothing big, but just kind of seeing how it would do. And, you know, when you're pulling him, when I was pulling him in the bike trailer, he's kind of further away from me than when I was jogging with him. He couldn't see me. So um, it was just a kind of that yeah. next level of like, is he comfortable with this? And so it was sort of like gradual steps um, building up to this bike tour. Like it definitely didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, I'd very intentionally given him time in this apparatus so that it was like it had good vibes for him. He was happy in it. And I knew he would nap in it really well. He always falls asleep in it. Um, So that's actually how we planned like our rides every day was basically around him napping in the bike trailer. That's amazing. You, yeah, you talked a little bit about the some of the gear, but I also know for a fact because I think this is, this came up on one of the Sprocket podcasts that uh, Cyrus has a little bike helmet as well, and I know that that's not easy to find for kids his age. Um, t- what, which what's the brand and and what do you think about it? The, the oh, little nutty yeah. from Nutcase. It's the uh, smallest one I think that they make, and we were given that by Aaron and Anna from the Sprocket podcast, and uh, it was. Anna has some bicycle uh, industry experience, and uh, it was one of the most useful gifts. I mean, we we got a lot of great gifts from a lot of great people, but I would say that one has paid off the most for uh, for the purposes of taking him out and keeping him safe. 
Yeah. And Cyrus has been blessed with a very large head. It's, his head is in the 90th percentile. So this helmet fit him like solidly well before the bike trip we had planned before the tour. Cause that was a little bit of a concern. Like, is this the helmet going to fit him by August? And he just has this like gargantuan head. So there were no issues there. Um, and fortunately he's a pretty strong kid. So like no problem with his neck supporting the helmet. And these are all things I hadn't even thought about, you know, before having a kid. And then suddenly like I have to, you know, take into consideration like the kid's bobblehead and making sure everything's, you know, secure and, it really is a whole new world when you when there are kids involved. I mean, I don't have kids, but my brother does. And, you know, mm -hmm. the stuff that I have learned just, you know, kind of peripherally, I'm just like, oh, you have to think about that kind of stuff. It's it's uh, mm -hmm. neck strength. Who knew? You know, but yeah, it's yep. something that's there. All right. All right. So you you had Cyrus all set for success. You know, you you brought him out. He's gotten used to the, the little chariot of his. He's got a little nutcase helmet and all of that kind of stuff. Now you're starting to turn and look at doing a bike tour. Where did you end up choosing to go? And did any, uh, what factored into that choice? Were there elements about, uh, how long he rides or where was, was the, the, his, what you learned about him in the bike, uh, a factor in what you ended up choosing? Yeah, there was definitely some very specific factors I was looking for when I was looking for a location to bike tour. Um, First of all, we had to go somewhere that we could keep going for two weeks because that's how much time we had. So it couldn't be a super long tour or a super short tour. Um, I wanted it to be beautiful, obviously. Um, I was I, I wanted there to be somewhere I wanted to be in a location where there'd be lots of places that we could stop like every five, ten miles that would be kind of hospitable. So we're not going to bike across Wyoming, <laughs> right, um, with a baby <laughs> the first time. Like I wanted – I was imagining, you know, a place with ocean and beaches and cute little towns and coffee shops and bakeries and breweries and like things to do along the way because I knew we couldn't pull the m kind of mileage that Brock and I used to do. We're not going to be doing 70, 80 miles in a day, which is what we would fill our time with on our – you know, past bike tours, like I knew we'd probably do 20 to 30 miles a day. And then that leaves a lot of time, um, for the rest of the day. So I also wanted there to be like some little, some hiking destinations. Um, so all of that to say, we ended up touring on Vancouver Island and also the, um, Southern Gulf islands, um, that are just North of the U S San Juan islands, right off the coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and I actually started like the wheels started turning for this bike tour a whole, a year, over a year ago when I was pregnant, I actually wanted our summer vacation when I was six months pregnant to be bike touring and Vancouver Island came up cause we'd heard great things about it from people. And it seemed like a nice, relaxed, beautiful destination with, it wouldn't be too hot. The weather's not that extreme. And then Brock was like, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to bike tour when you're like seven, six or seven months pregnant. So I was like really mad for about 10 minutes. And then we came up with a different plan. And I was like, okay, well, we're going to do this when we have our kid because I've done some research and it looks good. And when you got to seven months, you were pretty sure it was the right decision. Yeah, I, think. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I did not regret that decision. Um, so, so thanks Brock. Um, so Vancouver Island had exactly what I was looking for, like the beautiful scenery, lots of great towns with like gorgeous little bakeries. And I, I have a crazy sweet tooth. So, I mean, if I'm on vacation and I can have fresh bread for lunch every day, I'm in heaven. I thought you could only find that in Europe, but like, oh, you can also find it um, on these Canadian islands. Right. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, there were like, beaches to hang out on nice campgrounds. And for some reason, I also had it in my mind that Canadians were just going to be nicer drivers <laughs> than American drivers. That's not really founded on anything factual. It was just this like idea that I trusted Canadian drivers more than Americans. Like, <laughs> and you know, okay, with you know, mixed results, but um, but also I suspected that on these little islands, drivers would be courteous because most people on islands, they're just living on island time. They generally don't have like a huge agenda. They're not trying to commute into this big city and go to their high stress job. Like a lot of the people living on these islands are like retired people and it's just a lot chill, more chill. And um, that turned out to be the case. The traffic on the islands, like I was never scared by any of the drivers that passed us. Everyone was very courteous, taking it slow. Um, so 
that proved to be a really good destination um, with a kid in a bike trailer. That seems like such a reasonable, like kind of thoughtful planning for something like that. But yeah. as with anything with the bike tour, we all know that sort of, you know, you 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 plan for certain things and then right. sometimes things don't kind of work out that way. Was there anything in particular that you were sort of like your expectations were, you know, up here, they were a nine out of 10. And from an actual, you know, uh, a actual reality standpoint, ended up not meeting those expectations? Um. Yes. Uh, and I'd be curious what you say about this, Brock. I think uh, we we did have one really rough, I, like one kind of scary afternoon on the second week of the trip where I'd imagined us biking along the southern. We, we were back onto the main Vancouver Island and I was imagining this highway to be pretty mellow, not a lot of traffic. I thought I had read that there was a shoulder when I was doing my research and reading bike touring blogs. But it turned out that this highway we were going kind of along the Strait of Juan de Fuca, um, the closer we got to Victoria, the busier it became and the less patient drivers became and there was no shoulder. Um, so I wasn't really prepared for like that intense of a road. Um, so that being said, the the day after we made it to the bike trails, um, in the Victoria region, which were gorgeous. But yeah, that, that was a bit of a a jolt of reality. Like, Oh, uh, we kind of have to fend for our lives on this piece of road. And I wasn't, I, and I was like, how did I get myself into this situation? I thought I'd planned perfectly. I thought there were no chinks in this plan. And suddenly I'm now kind of like actually fearing for my life and shouting at, you know, this truck that rudely passed me. And so that was a little scary. Um, so that was one thing for me that, kind of was different than I planned. Um, what about you, Brock? So yeah, that was a tricky day of riding. And I think the trickiest part was that in addition to no shoulder and heavier traffic than we'd seen on the tour yet, there was also a lot of down and a lot of up. And that trailer is very heavy when you're going up. So yeah, it, it it's like, I guess just working harder, traveling slower and kind of feeling worse about the traffic for longer. <laughs> it was, uh, it was tricky. I, it's not that I wouldn't do it. I, I don't know if I'd do it again quickly, um, but also even even in that situation, I, I think I felt largely okay about it as long as I was willing to assert my space on the road. Um, the thing I still haven't quite figured out, and you would have a better beat on this, Adele, mm-hmm. is that uh, the trailer is of a certain width, and I'm not quite sure what that <laughs> width is. And even though I'm riding with a mirror, it's really hard for me to tell where the trailer is on the roadway because it's so low to the ground below me. So. Yeah. Um, it's just a difficult thing to, I could probably mount mirrors that would give me more visibility, but I didn't have those on this trip. So that was, uh, that was tricky. And when, when the shoulder is, uh, uh, either an abrupt drop off or, uh, uh, gravel down below the pavement that gets tricky. I think knowing exactly where you have to be. So I don't choose to be out there in front of a lot of traffic, but sometimes on that particular stretch of road, it was the only choice. So that was the place I think where I was the least comfortable having my child behind me on the road. Uh, but that being said, still never felt extremely threatened. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also, I have to recognize that I probably carry a certain amount of privilege and I'm uh, probably comfortable doing some maneuvers on the road that not everyone is comfortable doing. So uh, it's not like that would work for everybody. Um, I think the other portions of the islands that we went to were a lot friendlier when it comes to bicycle riders. And it it did kind of that hone in for me, it like hit home about how that stretch of road really wouldn't have been an issue if I had been bike touring on my own or with Brock. Like it would have been like, Oh, that was a little gnarly, but like, I wouldn't have thought twice about it. But suddenly when you're responsible for the life of this, like very vulnerable baby that's been in, you know, in your, he's entrusted to your care, like every little, um, safety issue does become much, much bigger. And I'm not like, I don't think of myself as this like super type a mom. Like I'm fairly laid back, but even for me, like that kind of pushed that into focus for me. Um, so it did, it did make me think like when I plan future bike tours, just to be very aware of what we could be getting ourselves into, make sure there's, um, you know, a a plan B or second option or bailout plan. Um, and definitely look for as many, uh, like multi-use trails as possible. Cause 
that's where it's at when you're bike touring with a kid. Yeah. Another yeah. thing that maybe we didn't anticipate was uh, the amount of sleep it's possible to get in a tent with a child. And oh, yeah. I didn't <laughs> I talk about this to too much because yeah. it was more of your experience than mine. But uh, yeah, that was something that we had to kind of figure out on the trip. Yeah. I When I imagined bike touring with a kid, I never thought of sleep as an issue. Um Sleep with a kid, with a baby is always challenging. Obviously, people talk about, you know, the sleep deprivation young parents get or early parents. Cyrus was like turning into this awesome sleeper at home, actually. So I've been very fortunate. He's been sleeping through the night for months. But camping is a different story. So I did not foresee for the first three nights probably getting like three to four hours each night max. So I was running on like super low <laughs> energy um, those first couple days. And then it, it got better by the fourth night and he started sleeping more. I started sleeping better. Um, so that that was definitely the roughest part for me was just like the sleep deprivation. That's um, really interesting. Do you think that yeah. there was anything that you could have done or anything that maybe you'd recommend for folks who are going out on a tour with a kid? like? At, Yes. <laughs> yeah. In terms of the sleep thing in particular, because you have, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if, you know, being in the, tr testing out sleeping in the backyard or, or just yeah. getting the kid used to hearing those noises that we all hear, you know, that wake us up as adults, but that must have just been a new experience for him. I'm curious what you think. I, I think for me, what I, what I realized was his, the, the sleep system we brought for him just was not sufficient. It wasn't doing the job. I'd brought like a therma rest, one of those waffle kind of accordion sleeping pads. And I doubled it up and then put like a fleece blanket on top and a little sheet on top. And I thought, okay, that's like the size of his body. He'll sleep on that and it'll be soft enough. And I have warm PJs and like little sleep bag for him. What I didn't anticipate is that he started rolling a lot in his sleep. So after an hour or two, he'd roll off onto the hard, cold tent floor and wake himself up. So what I did, I think after the third night, was I just made his bed cover an entire end of the tent. And it was thinner, so it wasn't as soft, but it was something. So when he rolled, he wouldn't wake himself up as much. So I would just recommend for parents bringing a baby along, don't skimp on the baby's sleep system. Like, don't skimp on that. Skimp on other things. Don't skimp on giving your baby a nice, soft, comfortable little maybe camping mattress. Make sure it's big if they're rollers. Um, so, um, yeah, that's that's what I would change for next time for sure. Did you talk about cutting the mattress up? Oh, I guess I cut it into two pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I cut the mattress into two pieces and put it side by side. Just the waffle foam. The, the waffle foam pad. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm yeah. curious, you said that uh, you would skimp on other things. So it sounds like that you brought, you overpacked on certain things. What were those things? Impossible. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think what I would skimp on. I mean, we, we packed, we didn't pack that heavily. I guess I would just, if you're an overpacker, yeah, maybe take a hard look at what you're bringing and don't bring that extra pair of jeans or something. I packed fairly lightly. I would just say, maybe be ready to carry a little extra weight. Like it, yeah. And that makes all the sense in the world. I mean, you're, it's a third person. So, I mean, of course there's going to be resources that you need to like kind of make that right. happen, but there's, <laughs> yeah. it's a, it's a specialized person with specialized needs. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you say was the best call that you made going into the tour? Yeah. I think one really good call that we made was just keeping our mileage fairly low, um, which was kind of hard to do for us. Maybe my ego took a hit. But again, especially at the beginning of the trip, um, I intentionally planned uh, two two nights um, to stay at, a camp, at each campground for two nights for the first eight nights. So we went to Shaw Island for two nights. Then we went to Salt Spring Island for two nights. And then we went to another island for two nights, et cetera. And that just allowed us to figure out how Cyrus is on tour at the beginning and sort of set up like a cycle touring routine for him. Um, and then also we didn't exhaust ourselves setting up camp and breaking down camp every night. And this maybe would sound kind of maybe a little lackluster, a little boring if you're touring solo. Like I would not recommend this necessarily if you're touring, you know, just with adults, but with a baby setting up camp and breaking down camp, it's just a lot more work because one adult has to kind of hang out with the kid the whole time. 
And so you're tag teaming. So it was really nice to really utilize like our setup at each spot for two nights. Um, and then with mileage, that was more between 20 and 30 miles that first week, we were able to just kind of relax and like go on some hikes and let Cyrus play, um, as much as he needed to. And then it'd be time for his afternoon nap and we'd put him back in the bike trailer and do the second half of the bike ride. Um, so I think that I was really happy with how that element of planning worked. Um, just like the amount of mileage and the, the not moving from a new to a new destination every night. That being said, we did start going to a new destination every night the second week, but by that time we were ready for it. Um, and it was fun. So that's yeah. cool. That sounds like a, a good idea to kind of ramp up to that though, that you, yeah. know, you gave yourself the space because you were learning as you were going, it sounds like. And by that point, you're a pro, so, you know. Yeah, the first few days was total unknown. We're like, is he just going to cry in the bike trailer the entire time? And we're just going to be, I did kind of imagine hauling this, like, wailing child through, you know, these vague, beautiful islands. And and that's, we, we figured out that if we put him in the trailer at about 10 in the morning, he would fall asleep very quickly and sleep for an hour or two, and we could get a good ride in to a destination, let him out, let him play, go to a coffee shop, eat lunch for a few hours put him back in the trailer and do the second leg of biking for that day. And he'd fall asleep for his afternoon nap. So yeah, the first few days were unknowns, but we were able to get a really good sense of, of how to do it, how to time everything. Um, after a few days, I'm curious what the reaction was, uh, from folks when they realized that you had Cyrus with you. I mean, that, you know, (laughs) as we all know, we get kind of quizzical reactions as bike tourists, but you know, Mm -hmm. bike tourists with a kid that must've been like times a thousand. What was that like? Um, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, he was being towed uh, behind my bike for how much does your kid weigh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. The question (laughs) shift. How dare you ask that? (laughs) He doesn't want to let you know. He's He's very sensitive sensitive about about his weight. (laughs) No, uh, it was nice because Tim, I think you and I have both acknowledged that there's a lot of questions people have and they're not bad questions. It's just that if you're bicycle touring, you hear them all the time. And as a bicycle tourist, you get tired of them. Uh, but I don't get tired of talking about my kid and, uh, I'd rather have questions about him than about, you know, how far we go each day or something. Uh, I feel like we got fewer of those kind of logistics yeah, questions. We did get fewer. Um, yeah. And I mean, this probably hits closer to what I would like to be asked on a tour is like, who are you? Why are you doing this? Or what, what do you like about bicycle travel? What kind of a person are you at home? Um, and so you get closer to that when they're asking you, how old's your kid? Uh, what, you know, somehow, I guess, because it's not about the distance or the weight or something. Uh, but maybe I've changed, too. I think maybe, I don't know, there's something about being a parent that uh, in the right conditions maybe makes you a bit more open and receptive to people in general. So Yeah, and I think people's reactions to us biking with a kid, I mean, they were all really positive. They were like, way to go, were. start him young, good job. Um, and I was impressed by, like, young Canadian families we saw out camping at these campgrounds that we were staying at. There were families out there with three month old babies camping. Um, they weren't bike touring, but, um, yeah, it was a fairly like outdoorsy culture going on up there. Um, so people weren't like, we never received any criticism, you know, how could you endanger your child? I, everyone was just very friendly, very encouraging. He opened a lot of, you know, doors for conversation and, um, you know, he like randomly waves at everybody. So he's, he's a friendly kid too, yeah, people, which doesn't hurt. People our parents age love him. He's like a grandma magnet. Yeah, he really is. So, yeah. uh, so I talked to a lot of grandmas. A lot of Canadian <laughs> grandmas. I love it. All the Vancouver Canadian, all the Vancouver grandmas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, it, it sounds like it went really, really well. Was, is there, was there any kind of thing that you... Uh, in terms of takeaways that you're like, you know what, I would do this differently next time. And that might be helpful for uh, folks who are listening that are considering doing this with their kid. Well, we bought a sleeping bag for it. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I was going to say a different sleep system for Cyrus. So we bought a kid's sleeping bag. Um, It just got in the mail. So we're going to go camping with him this weekend and test it out. So yeah, I would definitely have something softer and warmer for him. Um, What else would I do differently? I mean, you already kind of talked about being flexible, but there yeah, was that day where yeah. we thought we were going to have to ride through an endless cloud of mist and then oh, camp in the mud and, and kind of keep a baby out of the mud all day. And yeah. that didn't materialize. The weather turned up later, but we didn't know it at the time. So we decided to rent another night at the cabin we were staying in, which happened to be an option. 
Um, so the universe lined up for us in that way, but it was nice to, um, nice to know that just cause we planned something doesn't mean it has to go that way. We ended up riding longer mileage or kilometrage the next day. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't uncomfortable. It was long. It was a hard push, but it wasn't terrible. Yeah. And I, I think next time I, I'd probably just maybe want to be a little more relaxed and not as stressed before the trip. Cause I was kind of stressed out. How's it all going to go down? And now that I've done it and it went well, I could do it again, but with a lot less anxiety, I think. And that anxiety is inevitable, I suppose, if you're doing something completely new. Um, but if you know your kid, you know, your kid's rhythms, like you basically support that, but you're on a bike tour. It's like weirdly not as different for them as you might think it is. I think that's awesome because I so often with parents that I've run into, you know, they they really deviate their lives around the child. I mean, you do you you have to. I mean, the child is not going to, you know, hang sure. out with you at the bar and stuff, you know. But at, at the same time, you know, it's I think that a lot of folks give up their their adventures. And mm-hmm. that's why I really dug seeing from the I mean, that kid was three and a half seconds old and you already had plans for these great adventures. And I think that's really mm-hmm. awesome that you have that. And I also like that you're really open about uh, showing what's in the realm of possible for other parents out there. So good on y'all for doing that. Um, Thank any, you. Any other kind of thoughts about um, maybe how about what, what's next? What, you know, you've you really jumped over the wall on this one. This was a two week tour, which is amazing. You know, screw just look at the S two four zero with a kid to test things out. You went for two weeks. What's what's next? What's uh, do you have plans? We don't have solid plans. We've thrown some ideas out there. I guess our next big opportunity for a trip would be next summer. We might do smaller trips before then. Yeah. Um, but we've talked about another bike tour. Um, yeah, and in my job that I have now, I have a lot more flexibility with time off and maybe more unconventional time off than I would have had before. So um, it opens up some possibility to go, I don't know, different parts of the continent. Cuba. Cuba, sure. <laughs> um, Just but, throwing that out there, right? I know, right? Just, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, like, what? It really, like anything really is possible is, the, is one of the things I think that we learned on this. Like we didn't know how possible this trip was yeah. when we started it. And it turned out that it went really well. Um, we do like rail trails. It, it is nice. Like I'm not afraid of traffic, but I don't like riding in traffic. And so if I can mm-hmm. avoid that, if there are other good places, like, uh, I know you've done the Katy trail, right? I did. And I was yeah. just going to recommend that because I think that people in Missouri would throw a big bear hug around you all for, uh, for doing that. Uh, it, it, that's a really good one. And there's also, of course, the great Allegheny passage. And if you're going to do that, then I, well, I'll have to just come out and say hi. So and the can do <laughs> yeah. uh, the CNO, but yeah, uh, I like, I like the idea of doing a few more trail rides. Uh, there definitely, there were some Canadian trails that Canadians pitched to us as we yeah. met them. So yeah, we got a recommendation. If you like this one, try this other one. Mm-hmm. So I think we're going to, yeah, just, um, keep an eye on those rail trails, investigate further and, that's most likely what we're going to do next. That's really fantastic. I, I I think that that seems to be a great way to go about doing it. It's easing your way into these adventures. And then, you know, pretty soon you'll be going to Everspace Camp with Cyrus, you know, in, in a year or two, right? <laughs> <laughs> right that's, a good, that's a good target to set. We'll uh, backpack the next leg of the PCT with him when he's five, you know. Well, and we've we, got big plans for this little guy. As he soon as he's mobile, he's he's hiking the PCT. There you go. <laughs> We don't know exactly how possible it is to backpack. I think we'll be more bike tour than backpack in the next couple of years. But um, we're trying to figure out if we can carry him and anything we would need to camp for an overnight to see if that's possible. Uh, And then there's also it may not be. But then there's also knowing that bike touring is a great uh, a great adventure path until he's old enough to walk on his own and carry some of his own stuff. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel like. Uh, you already mentioned a little bit, but the false dichotomy that your life has to stop or that you have to stop having adventures. Uh, and we want him to have adventures. We'd like him to think about adventures as possibilities. And so uh, there's only one way to do that, and that's to model it. Mm-hmm. Start True. them while they're young. I think, yep. that's, I think that's a good way to close it all out. Uh, Adele and Brock, thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm I'm excited. And Cyrus, too. Thank you, Cyrus, for for uh, being the youngest, I think the youngest person ever to be on the Pedal Shift Project. Thank you, sir. (laughs) 
always, always, always fun to have Adele and Brock on the show. You may want to listen to Brock talking about this particular trip that he they just talked about right now on a recent episode of the Sprocket Podcast. Learn more there. Also, there was another recent rebroadcast of the Sprocket Podcast, which was a rebroadcast, I said that twice in a sentence, of the Crater Lake with the Kids trip from 2011 that they referenced in the show here as well. So check all of that out over at the Sprocket Podcast. Also, if you'd like to see some awesome images and some just cool stuff, uh, just get get your hashtag machine out. Uh, check it out on the Instas and I believe on Facebook as well. It's hashtag DirtbagFamily2019. Uh, great stuff there, and I've got links in the show notes as well. That's pedalship.net slash 179. You can check out a smattering of photos, including, uh, I'm gonna, i got to scroll through here because my recollection is that there's a good embarrassing one. Yes, yes, Brock sent me an embarrassing old picture of him. So if you would like to see an embarrassing picture of Brock in what can only be described as, um, wow, I guess there are leaves on this shirt. It's It's special. It's special. And you should see it. And he told me that I definitely shouldn't use it. So it's, of course, going in the show notes. Pedalship.net slash number. <laughs> Pedalship.net slash 179. I'm looking at young Brock Dittus here, and it's throwing my game off. What can I say? And as always, we'd like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows, meetups, tour journals, you name it. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot in annual options. If you're not into the whole small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittis, Thomas Skadow, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgatis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Stuart Buchan, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Paul Culbertson, Scott Culbertson, Cody Forchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robert, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Hankel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Aviles Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gephardt, Jody Zoranin, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Biggle, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Gothman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latoile Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Tom Bilch, Ronald Paroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafter, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messinger, and David Grotke. And thanks also to all past and anonymous donors for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.